everybody. Welcome to our third lecture on X-ray diffraction. I'm going to get my laser pointer going so I can kind of talk about the first slide of the lecture for today. And a lot of times I uh, talk about uh, this class being about uh, being able to differentiate between black and white or contrast uh, to analyze the data output by our uh, characterization instruments. Um, X-ray diffraction is uh, pretty much a, uh, the way we use it these days, a flavor of spectroscopy. And so we look at lines on the screen. And uh, here's an example of some recent work uh, that we're actually doing in the lab. And uh, this is actually a polymer spectra. And uh, polymer uh, polymeric materials do indeed exhibit a flavor of crystallinity. And uh, we're going to be talking about crystallinity and crystal structure and how that interacts with X-ray diffraction for this uh, lecture. So I thought uh, spectra like this was uh, quite appropriate to start the lecture off. And so we have two spectra here. So we have this blue line and we have this black line. And uh, they're two different conditions. Um, this blue line is amorphous. And uh, when you see a big hump like this, on an X-ray diffraction spectra, that means there's some amorphicity if it's very, very wide. Uh, when you see um, these peaks here, and there's actually quite a few. We're, we were, uh, I, I don't wanna get too far into this research because um, it'll kind of distract from what I'm trying to get to, but we were actually surprised to see uh, these many, this many reflections. And so if you see peaks like this, um, these count as reflections, and these reflections correspond with the dots uh, that you saw in the other diffraction pattern at the beginning of lecture two. So for a visible diffraction pattern, we see spots. For a diffraction spectra, those spots are replaced by peaks, okay? And then you can actually calculate the despacing of these peaks as well. So this black line exhibits a level of crystallinity. So we've processed the material in this black line differently. So we imparted a degree of crystallinity to our polymeric specimen. And we can interpret that by X-ray diffractometry by looking at these peaks and uh, where they lie kind of tells us some stuff as well. And we'll get further and further into this um, in the next two lectures. Uh, but first we need to talk about a little bit more about crystallinity. And in this case, uh, not talking about crystallinity in polymers, uh, but talking about crystallinity in uh, the materials that we're uh, pretty much more familiar uh, with as metallurgists, uh, metals. Um, crystallinity, the way uh, society and the way we as, as humans have um, tried to characterize matter um, has always had to do with some sort of shape. And it was these so-called platonic solids uh, that were first uh, kind of had this shape kind of theme um, being applied to uh, characterize the stuff around us, the substances around us, if you will. And a fire was represented by the tetrahedron. Air was represented by the octahedron. Something that was solid uh, was represented as a cube, which is actually kind of interesting if you think of metals. And most metals we deal with um, from an engineering perspective, at least in the, the, the raw elemental stage or some sort of cubic structure with the exception of titanium. Um, liquid icosahedron and the surrounding cosmos uh, was this uh, pentagonal dodecahedron. And these again are the so-called platonic solids. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about things. So if you have a cube of salt and uh, sodium chloride, if you will, um, the uh, salt will tend to cleave and it'll cleave uh, with planes that are coincident with 111. And that's all um, this little cubic structure trying to lower its surface energy. Um, kind of a little segue, but it popped in my head and I was looking at this cube for some reason. But bear that in mind. So, so the way society, at least Western cultures, um, have, been, have tried to characterize uh, the world around us has been by associating some sort of shape with each of the elements. Um, so we want to think about what is a crystal and uh, kind of have this bullet down here. So a crystal consists of atoms arranged in patterns which repeat in three dimensions. So kind of a repeating structure is a key characteristic on whether or not a substance is crystalline or not. And uh, if we look at this unit cell 
Um, I think this is face-centered cubic, and I did my best to draw it as face-centered cubic. Painstakingly drew it in PowerPoint, had to Google how to make a sphere in PowerPoint, so this isn't a circle. It's actually a sphere, even though it, I probably could have achieved the same uh, result just by drawing circles. But anyway, I wanted to throw that out there. Um, so we have a repeat structure. So we have our, our base unit cell, and then it starts repeating in three dimensions. And hopefully you can see that as I animate. So I'll go back and forth to hopefully make it more apparent. Um, if you're staring at the screen, we'll have another unit cell appear to the left of our original unit cell. And then we have another one appear to the front of our original unit cell and one above our original unit cell. So now we've kind of repeated in three dimensions. I probably should have had one go below to be truly three dimensional and probably one behind it and to the other side. But hopefully you all get the picture. A crystal consists of atoms arranged in patterns. These patterns repeat in three dimensions. Unit cell. Um, how do we characterize a crystal? Um, so hopefully this is review for some of you or all of you actually. And uh, we typically characterize a crystal with three sides and we, we, we usually don't denote these as A, B, and C. And we um, denote the angles that uh, characterize the um, angles between our sides as beta or alpha, beta, and gamma. So three sides, A, B, C, three angles, alpha, beta, gamma. Um, how these relate to one another uh, gives us the Brevet lattice and it's a, this defining the building blocks of pretty much all materials, at least all crystalline materials. Uh, don't forget this. I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have had this. Uh, you all have had this since uh, day one of, of Intro to Materials. Um, in the event that you haven't, there's um, seven lattice systems, 14 brevet lattice structures. It's good to know them. It's also good to be aware of the different designations uh, that are used. And I, I think it, I actually think it's between British and US kind of like aluminum and aluminium. Um, anyway, um, beware of the different designations. I'll kind of show that right now. Um, here is the um, designation of the, of the 14 brevet lattice structures um, derived from seven crystal systems. And uh, we wanna show this here that uh, rhombohedral is uh, what our book denotes this crystal system as. So rhombohedral is uh, A equals B equals C. I have to get a little closer to look. I should have this memorized. Alpha equals beta um, equals gamma, but none of them are equal to 90 degrees. Okay, so that's rhombohedral. Um, on other Brevet lattice structures, uh, rhombohedral becomes replaced with trigonal, and it's a little bit easy to uh, read. Um, so anywho, seven crystal systems, what are they? There's triclinic, monoclinic, so you have simple and uh, base-centered monoclinic. So here's one, two, uh, simple orthorhombic, base-centered, body-centered, face-centered. Oops, sorry. Uh, base-centered, body-centered, face-centered, so that's orthorhombic. So we have one, two, three. So triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, that's three. Um, we have tetragonal, that's four. So simple and body-centered tetragonal. Five is trigonal, sometimes called rhombohedral. Six is hexagonal, um, which titanium is always pops in my mind. I know there's other materials that are hexagonal, but titanium's my favorite, if you will. And then cubic, which is, so hexagonal is six, and cubic, the cubic system is seven. So seven brevet lattices, uh, when you break them down, you have different flavors of some, not all. Um, so there's only one flavor of triclinic. There are two flavors of monoclinic. Um, there's orthorhombic. There are base-centered, body-centered, face-centered, and simple. So there's four flavors of orthorhombic. Uh, for tetragonal, there's two. So simple and body-centered tetragonal. Trigonal slash rhombohedral, there's only one. And there's only one hexagonal. Some people um, claim or assert that this crystal structure trigonal is actually a subset of, of hexagonal. I saw it once in a figure and I, I, I can't visualize it to be honest with you, but some people probably can because they're all smarter than me. Um, anyway, simple cubic, body centered cubic, face centered cubic, three flavors of the, of the cubic system. Um, why do they do this? Well, if you go back to 
101 materials engineering, you have two atoms coming together. There's attractive and repulsive forces. You reach an equilibrium point for these atoms. And basically, these are the equilibrium points for a grouping of atoms in this crystal structure. So these atoms have all reached their specific equilibrium points. These equilibrium points will differ for various materials. Okay, so the fact that each material will have its own equilibrium point, which will give us a specific um, lattice parameter slash crystal structure, okay, means that we can actually use um, X-ray diffraction to identify what the materials actually are. Okay, so these equilibrium points from a simple model of atom A meeting up with atom B of the same substance, finding this equilibrium point on a greater scale gives us one of these unit cells and on an even greater sale gives, scale gives us a repeating unit structure or crystal structure, excuse me, um, allows us to analyze this material via X-ray diffraction. Very interesting stuff. Um, Structure property relationships, kind of wanted to throw this in here. Uh, so this is 6,4 titanium, uh, one of my favorite, favorite alloys, uh, the, the uh, black face. So again, using contrast to interpret our results, if you will. Um, this black phase is beta, which is body centered cubic. White phase is alpha, uh, which is um, hexagonal closed packed. Um, alpha is the primary phase. It's stable at room temperatures. If you see beta in a titanium microstructure, that means something was added to uh, stabilize it. And so probably vanadium. Um, you don't want the beta to take over. So you have to put in a little aluminum to stabilize the alpha. That's why you have 6,4 titanium. Alpha is generally the softer phase and black beta is the, uh, or beta is the harder phase. So different, different structure property. Um, this is a more dense, densified version of, of titanium, more densified flavor, which is why it's harder. Yeah. Okay, D spacing. So we have the 100 plane. Let me get my laser pointer. And we have this lattice parameter. So we refer to lattice parameter as A, and you all should have seen this at some point in time. So the lattice parameter is the distance between one atom and another atom in a crystal structure or in the same unit cell, if you will. Um, in this case, the D spacing is the same as A, okay? So that's not always the case. So from one 100 zero, zero plane to the next 100 zero, zero plane, um, your D equals to A, pretty simple. It's a cubic structure and we see this kind of repeat pattern here. Not always, not always the same. Um, the kind of the punchline of this slide is to let us know that D spacing is the distance uh, from one plane to the next same plane. Okay, so the distance between one 100 zero, zero plane to the next 100 zero, zero plane in the neighboring unit cell is D. So that's what D spacing means. Not always the case uh, where D will equals A, equal to A. Um, we generally use this equation to calculate the D spacing for a cubic, cubic cell anyway. Um, so D equals A uh, pretty much over your Miller indices. And so here D equals the square root of one. And so if we had our lattice parameter for our uh, material, we could calculate what the D spacing was. Um, I don't know if we really have to go through this calculation, but it's always good just for exercise points of view. Um, if you had 110, it would be a little bit more complicated. So it would be A over the square root of two. If you had 111 and you wanted to calculate the D spacing of 111, it would be A over the square root of three. Um, so very simple for cubic structures. Um, if you look at uh, the appendix, so this is the appendix from Brandon and Kaplan. Um, this is, I always hate it when they inverse this stuff, but hey, this is uh, what we get. We can, we can re, uh, rearrange this um, if we needed to. Um, if you look here, I, I rearranged D equals A over the square root of H squared plus K squared plus L squared. That came from this uh, um, somewhat more complicated flavor of the same equation. But you can see it differs for different crystal structures, okay? So cubic 
simplest, a tetragonal, a little bit more complex, orthorhombic, a little bit more complex, hexagonal, it's kind of complex, uh, rhombohedral scares me, and uh, monoclinic's uh, a little bit more complex as well. So you kind of have to know the uh, lattice parameters, and in some cases you have to know the angles between planes. Okay, so for monoclinic, you'd have to know beta. And for uh, rhombohedral, you'd have to know your alpha angle. Uh, triclinic is uh, spooky. This is, this is crazy. And I don't, I don't think I'd ever have anyone work this out. Um, it's it's, it's kind of crazy. Maybe I should. I don't know. Um, so let's kind of work out a, a quick problem uh, based on the lattice parameter of iron. Um, the D spacing of, uh, or the lattice parameter of iron is um, 2.87 angstroms. Uh, the, the D spacing of 100 is uh, 2.87 angstroms. Okay, uh, it's cubic, so we, we know. We saw in the representation what 100 is. Um, what's the D spacing of, of 200? And uh, we kind of insert this extra half plane. Um, so the D spacing of 200 is, is it's, if you can, you can work it out. So there's two ways you can do it. You can work it out. So you can say uh, D equals 2.87 over the square root of two squared. Um, or you can uh, visualize it, okay? So the D spacing is uh, 2.87. Uh, so the D spacing of 100 is 2.87. The D spacing of 200 is half of 2.87. Okay, because so it's the half space. Um, so that's one way to think about it. And uh, we can work it out the long way um, right now. So uh, dealing with uh, D spacing and lattice parameter and that uh, type of relationship, we have our series of uh, equations. Um, and they get more complex for anything that uh, isn't cubic. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with uh, iron, uh, which is BCC, so it falls in the cubic system, so we can use the equations uh, for a cubic um, crystal structure. Lattice parameter, let me try to make my pen a little thinner. Um, lattice parameter of iron, um, A is uh, 2.87 angstroms. And uh, so we know the D spacing of 100 is 2.87. Uh, we visualized it on the, on the previous slide. Uh, we can kind of guess what the D spacing of 200 is, but let's just work through it anyway. Um, so what's D? D of 200. D of, and so this is the family of planes. We could also do 020 or 002. It'd be work out the same mathematically. Um, D equals A over the square root of two squared plus zero squared plus zero squared. And hopefully you can read the writing. Uh, so D now equals, I should have put 2.87 in the first place, over the square root of four. And so D equals 2.87 over two. So this is supposed to be a four, you didn't see it well because of my poor writing. And so 2.87 divided by two, again, this is pretty much the half spacing of 100. Um, so it kind of makes sense um, that D would be 2.87 divided by two, which is 1.44 thereabouts. Uh, D equals 1.435 angstroms. If we care about significant figures, we can round up 1.4 angstroms. All right, so we know that um, for a crystal structure, for a metal like iron, uh, which would be BCC, and for copper, which would be FCC, um, that we have a crystal structure repeating structure. And so Lau, the scientist Lau uh, was one of the first people to actually start messing around with x-rays. 
and uh, he came up with the uh, so-called Lao equations. And uh, these equations are based on a path difference. And let me get my laser pointer. And so if you look, let's just say these are incoming x-rays. And here are a row of atoms. There's going to be a path difference uh, between the x-rays hitting this um, row of atoms and after they've hit this row of atoms. Okay, And so Lau realized that there is a photon slash material interaction with, uh, with rows of atoms or with, with crystalline materials. And you have to remember back when Lau was doing this stuff, there wasn't this fundamental knowledge of how material was arranged, of how atoms were arranged. Um, this kind of atomic structure was still kind of being theorized and uh, they didn't really have the tools to analyze materials like we do now. Um, so it wasn't factual to them that metals were arranged in a repeating structure, but his early experiments were shining light on the fact the materials were arranged within a repeating structure. Um, so Lau came up with these equations. He realized that there's a path difference uh, between the incoming and exiting um, x-rays. Okay, so he was doing this work with x-rays and different materials or crystals that he found out and about, I guess, and uh, kind of created this kind of so-called triangle math and you kind of see this repeating structure of our repeating theme of triangles. And there's a path difference uh, between this X and Y. Okay, so delta, and you have to realize that the path difference is going to be an integer of the wavelength of your X-rays. Okay, and here for A, he denoted the integer of H, and it has to be 1, 2, or 3. Okay, so it can't be 1.5 or anything like that. So H is gonna be one, two, or three, okay? And we'll just assume one for simplicity. Um, so there's a path difference delta and it's Y minus X. And so why is it Y minus X? Well, Y as he's depicted it here is greater than X, okay? So it's gonna take a longer distance to get from point A to point B. I don't know if my explanation made that great a sense, uh, but based on this triangle math, um, the line X made by X is going to be less than the line made by Y. Okay, so that's why delta is, is Y minus X. Delta also equals um, an integer times the wavelength of, of light. Based on the geometry we have here, we have different angles alpha. Okay, so the, the line X makes an angle alpha naught and the line Y makes the angle alpha. And so these atoms are separated by the lattice parameter A. So delta equals A cosine alpha minus cosine alpha naught. Delta also equals H lambda. Okay, so if you remember, this is only one side. So this is the side A. And again, path difference. I, I saved the animation because it was kind of obscuring what I was trying to point out, but there's a path difference Y minus X. If you take this same scenario for the three sides and the three angles that make up a crystal structure, um, you end up with delta equals H lambda, um, delta equals K lambda for side B, and delta equals L lambda for side C. So A corresponds with H, B corresponds with K, C corresponds with L. These are the so-called Lau equations. They're describing the path difference between your incident and your scattered beam. Lau is doing this awesome stuff, realizing that um, the beam of light, if you will, the ray of x-rays, if you will, ray of rotogen radiation was being manipulated by a repeating structure in the material he was examining gave us these Lau equations. The key thing that we still use today are HKL. Um, so it's where HKL notation comes from. So it comes from Lau. Always kind of pay homage uh, to some of the history of the stuff we work with.
Um, the origin of the of the crystallographic e equations developed by early crystallographers. Um, so inner inner planar spacing is a function of Miller indices. So these people started working with Lao equations, started working out math to kind of figure out this stuff. And it's actually a dot and cross products that, that make these equations. So D equals A over eight squared plus K squared plus L squared is, is what we live by for cubic systems. Um, there's different uh, notations here. And so I'll just kind of quickly go through here. Um, I think I messed up. I shouldn't have had D equals A K squared, H K plus K squared plus L squared. But anyway, look at the, um, at the appendices, okay? Uh, but these are the equations that people were dealing with and um, these are kind of vector notations and they were using dot, dot product and cross product. And we'll see kind of these artifacts of the math behind uh, some of the stuff we deal with um, in the actual practical equations that we use. So this would be a practical equation, D equals um, a over h square root of h squared plus k squared plus l squared. All came from dot product math. The notation came from Lao. And anyway, just kind of paying homage. Um, if you look at the fraction now, okay, so Lao equation, very complex, okay? Um, the, you have three equations to try to piecewise everything together. Uh, Bragg's law is far more elegant. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, you look here, you have um, the beam diffracting on this row of atoms versus the beam diffracting on this row of atoms, okay? So the crystal, the plane, crystallographic planes are essentially a mirror. And if you're at the right so-called Bragg condition, you will achieve diffraction, okay? So if this incident beam is the correct angle theta, you will achieve diffraction. And this angle is the so-called Bragg angle. And uh, we're gonna talk a bit a bit more, bit about, ugh, bit more about Bragg's law. Um, so Bragg's law is N lambda equals uh, two, two D sine theta. D is the D spacing. So hopefully the slides before this clued you in to what D spacing is if you didn't already know. Uh, sine theta is the angle of the, um, incoming x-rays and lambda is the wavelength. Um, N refers to order of diffraction. And for practical purposes, we usually say N equals one when we work some of this stuff out. And uh, this is supposed to be theta, so I had a boo-boo on my, uh, my um, PowerPointing. Um, so these guys won the Nobel Prize for Bragg's Law. And there's kind of the legend that says the father, Sir William uh, Henry Bragg, is actually the, the person that did all the work. But William Lawrence Bragg actually punished, uh, published it, punished it, published it, and I think made his dad quite angry. Uh, but in the end, they were both awarded um, the Nobel Prize uh, for, for in physics for developing Bragg's Law in uh, 1950. So they earned the prize in 1915. I'm not quite sure when they actually came up with uh, Bragg's Law um, and Lambda equals 2D sine theta. Um, one thing to think about X-ray diffraction, and we're going to see some of this stuff again when we talk about electron diffraction, pretty much the same thing, both kind of relying on the wave particle duality of the photon and electron. Um, they're an elastic process, so no energy is lost. The wavelength is unchanged. Uh, the crystal lattice is regular and repeating structure, uh, sorry, structure. And so the interaction of X-rays and electrons with uh, this uh, um, structure creates diffraction patterns. And we've seen that at the beginning of lecture two with those spots. All right, so derivations of the world famous Bragg's Law. Again, um, let me get my laser pointer going. Again, the N refers to order of diffraction. Um, it has to be some integer of lambda. And uh, if you go and Google Bragg's Law, as uh, maybe it would be a good idea to, um, and I did, and uh, that's where I got this picture from. I, I happened to find it from this web page. Um, I could probably have drawn it myself, but it's all over the place. So. 
This is probably the most common uh, depiction of how to derive Bragg's Law. It's the most simple derivation of Bragg's Law. And um, I, I don't like it and I'll tell you why. But um, I altered this picture uh, by adding uh, point X and point Y. And uh, the, the reason I did that is because uh, you have uh, this X-ray beam and it bounces off of this plane of atoms and you have, uh, and so this is A, C, and then you have another uh, beam of X-rays, A prime to C prime, that's, that's bouncing off the uh, next row of atoms. And uh, you have a path difference now, and, and the, the key to Bragg's law, um, which was also the key to Lao equations, is some sort of path difference, okay? And, and that's kind of the principle of diffraction, I guess, if you, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, that path difference is uh, given by the uh, summation of line x b prime and uh, line b prime y and uh, you can then use uh, this kind of right triangle uh, geometry and uh, well so first i kind of got ahead of myself sorry uh, first you have to uh, realize that x b prime is equal to b prime y um, now you can use your right triangle uh, trigonometry or geometry and uh, realize that sine theta equals xb prime over d, because this uh, length is given to us by our d spacing d, uh, the inner atomic distance there. And uh, so we could rearrange this equation and say xb prime equals d sine theta. So we're starting to see some uh, similarities now with Bragg's law. And we can do some substitution uh, with our first equation describing path difference. And our other equation that uh, tells us that x b prime equals b prime y and say that n lambda now equals d sine theta plus d sine theta because uh, both of these line segments are uh, signified by d sine theta. Um, so now we have our proper Bragg's law n lambda equals 2d sine theta. And uh, this is fine and dandy. But I really hate this representation, and I hate this representation. I've always hated it uh, because um, you have this extra line segment here that just kind of is ignored. And the reason why they ignore it is because I, I call this the so-called geometric or the D-row called geometric derivation of Bragg's Law. And because uh, the other flavors of, of Bragg's Law derivations uh, they're very similar, and I discussed it before. Uh, they're very similar to the figure in the book um, that shows the uh, rows of atoms acting like a mirror. And uh, here's one uh, such derivation, and this picture looks very similar to the figure in the book. And you see it's a lot more complex. And so we have uh, these three triangles uh, that we've uh, kind of derived from this diagram. So this is similar to the figure in the book where you have uh, the mirror effect of the atoms bouncing here, and then you have another mirror effect of the atom uh, bouncing off of B here. And so now you have this path difference, uh, which could really be thought of as uh, these, these two segments here, okay, A to B and B to C. And uh, you have to solve uh, for these three triangles. I'll let you pause it and stare at it if you're interested. Um, and then uh, use some trig identities uh, to get through some of this stuff, uh, namely uh, one minus uh, cosine squared theta um, being the trig identity, um, and one minus cosine squared theta equals uh, sine squared theta. So that's a, that's a critical uh, uh, trig identity. Um, anyway, you can uh, then get Bragg's Law that way. Um, this is the way I learned it. I, I mentioned I learned it uh, if I... I think I did mention it earlier with laser scatterometry. Um, again, another tray identity, it's the same one, but a different derivation. Um, it's my humble belief that people accept this kind of, I call it the baby way to derive Bragg's law um, because uh, they want to be able to do it the most simple way possible. So they draw a convention that's patently incorrect. And if, for me, this is the more correct way, one of these two variations uh, to derive Bragg's law. Um, we'll have this other derivation uh, later. Uh, this is um, 
in terms of k vectors. So we're talking about k space. And uh, maybe I should talk about it here because x-ray diffraction can be thought of in terms of k-space. Um, you then get another uh, flavor of Bragg's law. And uh, this is kind of a two-dimensional lattice. Um, don't stare at this too, too much uh, because I'm going to save this flavor of Bragg's law for electron diffraction. All right, so Lao, um, this is kind of a simple depiction of a Lao diffractometer. And uh, so we have our X-ray source somewhere over here. The X-ray passes through the crystal and we create this crystal pattern. So we have a dot here and a dot here. Um, we have the center spot. So we're gonna have the first order reflection uh, given to us by radius one and the second order deflection given to us by radius two. Um, the despacing of the first order is always going to be greater than the second order and so forth. So as the rings go out, your despacing is actually decreasing. So don't forget that. Um, we'll kind of bear that more in mind when we deal with electron diffraction. Um, if, you can, if you take this to angle theta and you realize that this is a right angle here, because you're hopefully, I don't know if you can tell by this depiction, but it's like you're, you're projecting it on a wall or something that makes a right angle with uh, the distance D. So D is the distance between your specimen and the recording plane. And uh, R is the radius to the first single, or R1 is the radius to the first circle, and R2 is the radius to the second circle. Um, so you can, you can calculate, actually you can calculate theta, okay? And here R actually equals to the D spacing, and, um, or it's analogous to the D spacing, okay? To get the actual um, d spacing or lattice parameter, you could then plug that into Bragg's law. So you can solve for theta based on your measurements, plug that theta in the Bragg's law. So lattice diffraction, uh, you can use it to create simple X-ray diffractometers, uh, pinhole, and photographic film. Uh, the d space, the actual d spacing, uh, can be calculated uh, by inserting the value for theta into Bragg's law. And it's also used uh, single crystal diffractometers, as I've mentioned before. Um, let's work out a Bragg's law example. And uh, so, and I maybe I shouldn't be drawing it this way, but let's just let's just go with it. So let's just say this is the one 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 plane. I tried to make it angled, so you see it's one 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 plane. Um, lambda equals one point five four angstroms or angstroms. Uh, copper K alpha. Uh, the silver. So this is silver. Uh, is the lattice constant. So we're, we're using, we're examining silver and uh, the lattice constant A equals uh, 4.09 angstroms. And so we wanna know, does this exa example satisfy Bragg's law? Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, work through this right quick. Uh, when I work through it, I think it'll be a little bit less confusing uh, than I've depicted it here. All right, so we have our Bragg's law example. Um, this is one, one, one. Um, I've kind of drawn it with uh, this little angle to kind of show you that it's one, 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 and it's it's. I I kind of I'm almost scolding myself for the way I've drawn this. Um, so this would also be theta. Um, this would also be theta. Um, if you look at the way I drew it, it makes you think that it's always forty-five or always yeah always ninety degrees. Um, that's not necessarily the case. It's just kind of the way I drew it. Um, collectively, this is two theta. And so kind of foreshadowing the X-ray diffractometry, um, the X-axis is always given in terms of two theta. And uh, that's because the detector is always referenced with respect to the source. And uh, so this is why it's, it's two theta on an X-ray diffractometer. But that's a kind of a segue moving ahead. Uh, we want to know if this example, if 15 degrees is indeed the, the Bragg angle. And... Uh, so we wanna kind of figure it out. So we're using lambda equals 1.54. And so lambda equals uh, 2D sine theta. We're assuming N equals one. Um, we're, we wouldn't be um, scolded for doing so because one, one, one uh, would be a first order reflection as well. And uh, our lattice constant A is uh, 4.09 angstroms and um, I'm going to keep that level of significant figures because you have to be pretty precise uh, with X-ray diffractometry. Um, so A equals um, 4.09 
and then I'm going to leave that O off. So 4.09 angstroms. And uh, so we want to figure out D, okay, because we're wanting to find if theta is correct and or if theta would be a Bragg angle. And so we already know lambda is 1.54. Um, we can figure out D from A because we know silver is uh, cubic, so it's FCC. And uh, so we're going to solve for theta in this case. And so let's uh, first figure out D. Um, so D equals 4.09. So our units are going to come from our lattice parameter angstroms over the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. And so D equals 4.09 angstroms over the square root of 3. Let me uh, pull up my fancy calculator. All right, so 4.09 divided by the square root of 3 is 2.361. And I will write it out. All right, so we have D, we have um, lambda, and we have to solve for theta. And so sine theta equals lambda over 2D. Um, <laughs> theta equals... Oops, sine negative one, I tried to draw it ahead of myself over lambda, sorry, lambda over, sorry, two times 2.361, and so 1.54, sorry. I think I'm overcomplicating this over two times 2.361. Sorry about this, y'all. Okay, 1.54 divided by, All right, so I got 19.03 for theta. So this does not solve Bragg's law. No, it does not. It does not solve Bragg's law. So kind of thinking ahead, what angle would solve uh, Bragg's law? And uh, we kind of already did it. Um, what angle would solve for Bragg's law, um, the angle we actually got. So 19.03 uh, would solve for, would actually solve for Bragg's law. Ah, come on now. There you go, 19.03. So if someone asked you, well, what angle would solve for Bragg's law? 19.03 would solve it. So we worked through this one. And uh, we found that it really didn't satisfy Bragg's law. We then asked the question, well, what angle would satisfy Bragg's law? And, uh, well, the answer, uh, when we proved that it didn't satisfy Bragg's law, was roughly 19 degrees. Uh, the whole point of this exercise, and uh, you could also work it out the other way and uh, solve using theta and try to figure out what um, last parameter you get or something. You could work it out the other way. Um, but the, the thing you want to walk away from this little exercises in general it's hard to satisfy Bragg's law and that is what makes x-ray diffraction such a powerful tool it's actually hard to satisfy Bragg's law um, so you can you can uh, actually get a distinct identifier of your uh, your materials basically um, kind of pose this question to you uh, kind of rehashing what we said before and I, I actually hate this diagram um, because it makes you think that it's always a 90 degree angle, but it's really not. Uh, the XRD spectra is always reported in terms of two theta. And if you go back to the first slide, you'll see, yeah, it was uh, recorded or reported the, the x-axis was two theta. Um, why, you may ask. 
um, well, the detector is always uh, referenced with respect to the source. And so if you draw a line continuing from the sample from the source, and you actually get two theta uh, from that, right? So theta, theta, two theta, always reported um, in terms of or with respect to the source, that's why. Um, another question, I'll just kind of throw this in now, um, the limit to resolvable despacing. So there are some people that say that if you have a despacing that's less than lambda, um, you, you can never um, diffract it. Well, according to kind of rule of thumb theory, um, half the wavelength is actually the, the resolvable despacing. Um, and that's a rule of thumb, okay? Always remember it's a rule of thumb because you're ignoring uh, part of the equation. If you say lambda over two equals D, or you're, you're removing part of the equation. So it's a rule of thumb, uh, but we'll see another uh, representation of this later. And uh, so this is a shout out to VeggieTales, a good place to stop and think about what we have learned today. And uh, we'll pick up um, some more uh, meatiness, if you will, of x-ray diffractometry in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your time. Oh my. It's the end of the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me at droberson at utep.edu.